Good morning. I'm Evo Dahlberg, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And thank you all, and especially for our members for joining us for this live program today. Just as a reminder, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent organization. And therefore, the views expressed by individuals we host on our platform are their own, and they do not represent the institutional positions or views of the Council. Now to our main program. COVID-19's negative effects on the global economy has exacerbated existing inequalities and highlighted the importance of finding solutions through international cooperation. Today, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, joins us here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs to discuss the U.S. role in promoting an inclusive and sustainable global economic recovery ahead of this week's International Monetary Fund annual spring meeting. After the Secretary's remarks, I'll introduce a number of our Council members to pose questions uh, to Secretary Yellen. But right now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker. Janet Yellen is the 78th U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. She's an economist by training and took office after almost 50 years in the academy and public service. She is the first and only person to have served both as the head of the Council on Economic Advisors, the head of the Federal Reserve, and now as Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary Yellen, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thanks so much, Evo, and thank you uh, to the Council for this invitation. America is strongest when we engage with the world. When I was born, the United States was still recovering from the Great Depression and World War II. These tragedies cost countless lives. Too many families lost nearly everything. But from the devastation, we learned an invaluable lesson. The United States must not go it alone. In the aftermath of the destruction, the United States built strong political and security alliances that have helped keep our country safe and helped our economies flourish. We created global institutions such as the United Nations and financial institutions such as the International Monetary Fund and World Bank to reduce economic conflict and address global poverty. With strong US leadership and working together with our allies, we contained communism and created a dynamic world economy and growing markets for US exports. America's middle class prospered. Millions across the world were lifted out of poverty. But over the years, new problems developed that were not properly addressed. In the push to grow our economies, we neglected our environment. As we embraced new technologies, we didn't do enough to prepare our workers and our education systems for the changes underway. While we embraced trade as an engine for growth, we neglected those who did not benefit. And in the most recent period, when we might have adopted policies at home to face these issues and joined with our allies to address issues abroad, we isolated ourselves and retreated from the international order that we created. Over the last four years, we have seen firsthand what happens when America steps back from the global stage. America first must never mean America alone. For in today's world, no country alone can suitably provide a strong and sustainable economy for its people. Over time, a lack of global leadership and engagement makes our institutions and economy vulnerable. To make matters worse, COVID-19 struck. The virus has taken over 550,000 American lives. Our family members, our friends, our neighbors, and millions more around the world. We did not respond sufficiently last year to address the devastating health crisis at home and failed to engage early to address the crisis beyond our borders. 
and with the health crisis came the economic crisis. We sought to protect those most vulnerable, but millions of workers lost their jobs and all too many small businesses shuttered. Women and people of color bore the brunt of the economic hardship, exacerbating century-long inequalities that plague our society. We can do better. We must do better. The American people elected President Biden and Vice President Harris to tackle these challenges. The pandemic, the economic crisis, a hollowing of the middle class, systemic racism, deepening inequality, and climate change. To not just return us to life as it was before the pandemic, but to build back better, creating a prosperous economy for all. Credibility abroad begins with credibility at home. How can America help lead the world out of the dual crises of pandemic and economic recession if we can't lead ourselves out of it? It's a fair question, and it's why last month President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan into law. The Rescue Plan is easily the largest relief package since the Great Depression. It includes powerful measures, rental assistance, unemployment insurance, direct payments to help Americans make it to the other side of this crisis. And this package is designed not only to help our economy survive the scars of the pandemic, but to create a foundation for our economy to thrive. The work has already begun in less than four weeks, this administration issued more than 130 million vital relief payments to individuals and families. We provided more than 100 million vaccine shots in just 58 days, but we have more to do. Last week, President Biden outlined a plan to rebuild America, creating a more sustainable and more resilient economy with the 21st century infrastructure. The plan will fix America's crumbling highways and bridges, upgrade ports, airports, and transit systems, build a renewed electric grid, deliver high-speed broadband to all Americans, and invest in basic research and science. It proposes affordable and accessible caretaking options for older Americans and our nation's children, and an education system that trains our workers to thrive in the modern global economy. Beyond our borders, as the pandemic is made clearer than ever before, the global community is in this together. We will fare better if we work together and support each other. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to restoring U.S. leadership in the multilateral system to help make the world economy stronger and advance American interests. The United States needs to have a strong presence in global markets on a level playing field. We will cooperate with willing partners to protect and enforce a rules-based order. Our economic relationship with China, like our broader relationship with China, will be competitive where it should be, collaborative where it can be, and adversarial where it must be. We will defend democracy and the human rights of all people, of women and girls, LGBTQ plus individuals, and people of every race ethnic background and religion, to help ensure that those rights are protected at home and abroad. In all our international engagements, President Biden and I will stand up for the American people and American business, as well as these core values that define America. 
I'd like to spend time today discussing three key objectives that guide our economic engagement with the rest of the world, which I believe are necessary to help realize the vision of our nation. The first objective is a stable and growing world economy that benefits the US economy. For the United States to prosper, our neighbors too must prosper. In the modern world, recession, instability, and crime abroad find ways to wash upon our shore. Strong and stable economies abroad make us safer. We will benefit if countries can maintain or create economic, social, and political conditions favorable to an open society. We will benefit if, in, if individuals around the world can pursue their aspirations, regardless of conditions of birth, and if women have truly equal rights and opportunity to be included in the economy. We will benefit if people, while retaining cultural differences, share core values of free speech, free exercise of religion, and respect for diversity. Of course, stronger growth abroad also means a stronger economy here at home. As other economies prosper, demand for US exports of goods and services increase, creating jobs. When developing countries are economically successful, their growing populations and rising living standards mean a higher consumer base for the United States. In 1990, 40% of US exports went to emerging economies. By 2020, it was 60%. This demand for American products creates US jobs that pay better. Studies have shown that women in particular could earn as much as 20% more in these export-based jobs. At the time of the global financial crisis in 2008, we learned that an interconnected economy brings vulnerabilities. Post-crisis reforms have strengthened global banks and reduced systemic risks, but vulnerabilities, particularly in the non-bank financial sector remain. So as we pursue a stronger world economy, we must also pay attention to existing financial stability risks and new risks that may arise. To do so, rather than retreat, we must closely coordinate with our partners. We should aim to mitigate risks and promote a sound financial system at home and abroad so that Americans have steady access to the finance needed to build back better money to start a new business, to buy a home, and to create wealth for themselves and their children. The second objective <clears throat> is to fight poverty and promote a more inclusive global economy that aligns with our values. Unless we act now, the world is susceptible to the emergence of a deepening global divergence between rich and poor countries. This threat, which has never been more pressing, will likely result from divergent capabilities to contain the crisis and bring about economic recovery. Like the United States, rich countries and some large emerging markets have had the means to support their economies while they pursue a health solution. And like the United States, they've gained access to vaccination. Of course, it's too early for advanced economies to declare victory. I'm urging our partners to continue a strong fiscal effort and avoid withdrawing support too early to promote a strong recovery and help avoid the emergence of global imbalances. Many middle and low income countries are in a different place, lacking the finance to support their economies and people during COVID-19 and constrained in their wherewithal to obtain vaccines. 
the result will likely be a deeper and longer lasting crisis with mounting problems of indebtedness, more entrenched poverty, and growing inequality. Their crises will push as many as 150 million into extreme poverty this year, reversing the trends of the last two decades with women, youth, low skilled, and informal workers particularly hard hit. Moreover, an additional 120 million people became acutely food insecure in 2020, and that trend could worsen. This would be a profound economic tragedy for those countries, one we should care about, but that's obvious. What's less obvious but equally true is that this divergence would also be a problem for America. With few exceptions, stable and prosperous economies tend to be less of a security threat to the United States. And the human crisis of refugees and migrants will only be solved if we have stable and secure growth in the rest of the world. So how do we help the poorest countries get through this crisis? Our first task must clearly be stopping the virus by ensuring that vaccinations, testing, and therapeutics are available as widely as possible. Low-income countries risk falling to the back of the line and may not achieve widespread vaccine coverage until 2023 or 2024 at the current pace. More work and funding are needed to secure vaccine purchases, address manufacturing shortages, and finance and facilitate the domestic rollout in low-income countries. We also need to help lessen the economic pain in low-income countries during a protracted recovery period and use this opportunity, as we're doing in the United States, to facilitate structural transformations to more inclusive and sustainable economies. The IMF and the World Bank have already played an important role on this front, and we're working to strengthen their ability to support the poorest countries. We've created a new multilateral framework to help low-income countries address unsustainable debt burdens. And at the IMF, we're working to issue $650 billion in new special drawing rights, an international reserve asset that will increase buffers for all IMF members and give low-income countries the additional liquidity for greater spending on vaccines and healthcare. Embedded in recovery efforts, we have an interest in helping countries pursue sustainable and inclusive growth and strengthen long-term resilience. Our response will not be successful if we end up just where we were before. A personal objective of mine is to focus our international engagements on fostering full legal rights and greater economic and education opportunities for women and girls, given the clear evidence that this will support inclusive economic growth more broadly. Speaking from my own experience, we need to do better at reducing barriers for women's economic empowerment, even unconscious ones, in nearly every country in the world, including the United States. Finally, there are certain matters where we are in it together, where the challenges are global, and no one country will be successful if it goes at it in isolation. The most evident immediate example is the need to address global health risks. COVID-19 has clearly shown that pandemic responses require global cooperation. We're working with our partners to enhance pandemic preparedness against future shocks. 
We need to learn lessons from this pandemic to be better prepared to stop future contagious diseases before they become full-scale pandemics. Another global challenge we face is how to adapt to technological change, which has brought significant benefits, but contributed to greater inequality. Digitalization is the latest technological advance that provides an opportunity to raise productivity and increase connectivity, both at home and globally. Even just a year ago, I never thought that I would be re regularly joining meetings with colleagues in London, Delhi, Sydney, and everywhere in between from the comfort of my office in Treasury. But the digital divide has also exacerbated inequality and digitalization has raised concerns about privacy, illicit activity, and threats of surveillance and cybersecurity attacks from our adversaries. I will be working domestically and closely with our allies to promote innovation in digital finance in the interest of cheap, instantaneous, and reliable commercial and financial transactions, but also to ensure that we modernize our legal and regulatory frameworks to take account of the risks and threats inherent in the use of these new technologies. Another consequence of an interconnected world has been a 30-year race to the bottom on corporate tax rates. Competitiveness is about more than how US headquarters com headquartered companies fare against other companies in global merger and acquisition bids. It's about making sure that governments have stable tax systems that raise sufficient revenue to invest in essential public goods and respond to crises and that all citizens fairly share the burden of financing government. President Biden's proposals announced last week call for bold domestic action, including to raise the US minimum tax rate and renewed international engagement, recognizing that it's important to work with other countries to end the pressures of tax competition and corporate tax base erosion. We're working with G20 nations to agree to a global minimum corporate tax rate that can stop the race to the bottom. Together, we can use a global minimum tax to make sure the global economy thrives based on a more level playing field in the taxation of multinational corporations and spurs innovation, growth, and prosperity. Let me end by discussing the biggest long-term threat the world faces, climate change. After sitting on the sidelines for four years, the United States is committed to doing its part. We have a narrow moment to pursue action at home and abroad to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of that crisis and to seize the opportunity that tackling climate change presents. President Biden has released a plan to combat climate change, including through rejoining the Paris Agreement, investing in sustainable infrastructure, and creating new green jobs. He's committed to release an ambitious strategy this year to outline US domestic greenhouse gas targets that are consistent with our work internationally. Domestic action must go hand in hand with US international leadership aimed at significantly enhancing global action. To this end, Treasury is working closely with our international partners and international organizations to implement ambitious emissions reduction measures, protect critical ecosystems, build resilience against the impacts of climate change and promote the flow of capital toward climate aligned investments and away from carbon intensive investments. 
We're also working to ensure that climate risk is integrated into the financial system so that financial institutions, regulators, and investors can make informed decisions. I'm pleased that Treasury is co-chairing a newly launched G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, where finance ministries and central banks will work together to identify mechanisms for promoting green investments and accelerating transition to a net zero economy. As I prepare to meet with my colleagues from around the world this week at the IMF and World Bank spring meetings, I find myself thinking back to the policymakers who gathered in Bretton Woods a year before I was born to define our post-war order. Though it was a different time, I empathize with the enormous weight they faced, the pressure to come together after a global catastrophe in building an enduring and interconnected system aimed at promoting peace and prosperity throughout the world. Our current juncture is no less significant. What we do in the coming months and years will have profound impacts on the trajectory of our country and on the global economic order. Of course, there are key differences from the post-war era. Maybe most noticeably, I will be joined later this week by other female finance ministers, central bank governors, and heads of international financial institutions. Not enough, but a start, as well as diverse representatives from all corners of the globe. In our interconnected and digital world, and considering the pandemic, I will be logging onto a computer to join these meetings, not trekking to a mountain resort in New Hampshire. Yet the most important difference today is a fundamental recognition that our policies at home and abroad must be designed to be inclusive, tackle inequality, and respect our environment. In this context, I will use the spring meetings this week to advance discussions on climate change, press our partners to do their part to support a strong global economic recovery, strengthen tools to improve vaccine access and financing for the world's poorest economies and increase the focus on inequality, including for vulnerable populations and women and girls. I'm honored to serve the American people once again, to listen to the underrepresented, to be bold in action, and to cooperate with our global partners to solve the challenges we face together in building the next century of prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Yellen, for that really insightful speech and, and a reminder of how what is happening uh, around the world affects and impacts us here at home, uh, as well as how uh, as we move forward together with our partners, we need to uh, find a world that is more inclusive as well as uh, more sustainable. I really appreciate your comments. We would uh, uh, now like to turn to some of the members of, of the council. And the first person uh, joining us is Dori McWhorter. She is a member of our board and the CEO of the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. Dori. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Secretary Yellen. It is an honor to have you here with us today. I wanna to also thank you for acknowledging the importance of gender equality for economic prosperity. And I know you know that many studies, including the IMF and the World Bank, reference achieving gender parity and how it can add trillions of dollars to the global economy. But how do we actually get countries to prioritize gender parity as part of their economic recovery agendas and not just see them as women's issues? Well, I think there's a wide range of steps that we need to take to promote gender um, equality um, in our own economy. Um, one of the thing, uh, increased uh, involvement 
of women in the labor force has, as you indicated, um, really promoted advances overall for uh, the United States and certainly served to raise family income. But female labor force participation has leveled off at a rate that's lower than we see in many advanced economies. And in looking for the reasons, um, it, it, it looks as though our failure to provide affordable childcare and paid leave is important. And so as we think about our own policies in the United States moving forward, I would say that it makes sense um, to focus on enhancing uh, benefits in those areas, particularly to um, promote a more inclusive environment for women to participate in the labor market. And the IMF and World Bank have um, prioritized uh, similar kinds of steps around the world, uh, improving legal rights and equality for women in many countries where um, they're hindered by legal barriers and social barriers to participate and also supporting them, their participation through uh, greater education for women and other programs. Thank you, Secretary Yellen. Uh, our next question comes from Alex Liu, who is a young professional at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Alex? Thanks, Evo. And Secretary Yellen, thank you for taking the time to speak with us this morning. As, no, as you mentioned earlier, the pandemic has had a significant impact on students as well as younger people in the workforce. Uh, from your perspective, I guess, you know, do you have any advice or suggestions for us to become, you know, not only thrive in the global digital economy, but also become more fluent in global issues? Uh, well, I, I think it's very important for young people to um, study about the global economy and um, the ways in which we're interconnected with our neighbors um, and to appreciate uh, the importance of the multilateral system that we've developed in the post-war period and the need for cooperation uh, to share uh, global uh, to share global responsibilities and work cooperatively on um, mutual problems like climate change. Um, so I hope that young people will uh, focus on and study uh, about the global economy and its importance. Um, this pandemic has been particularly tough on young people who are uh, in school and have had to study remotely. Um, I'm very hopeful that because of the steps that we're taking, uh, including um, speeding vaccinations, dealing with the pandemic and the economic support that we're providing, that uh, the job market is going to become far more robust uh, in the months ahead and that young people will um, in coming months find a job market where um, they can find good opportunities to get ahead and get on the ladder to success. Thank you, Secretary Yellen. And the next question comes from Regina Cross. Uh, Regina is a vice president at, the, uh, at Goldman Sachs, as well as an alumna of our Emerging Leadership Program. Regina. Thank you, Eva. And thank you, Secretary Yellen, for your leadership. The proposed SDR allocation seeks to stabilize and support lower income and developing nations in the wake of the more than 3.5% global economic contraction. How can the US collaborate with other nations to ensure equitable distributions for the most vulnerable populations and accountability and support of democracy for all? Thanks so much for that question. We are very supportive of an allocation of SDR at this time, particularly because of its potential to um, help low-income countries that are burdened by debt and lack the fiscal space uh, to deal with the pandemic and its economic consequences. 
Um, when special drawing rights are allocated by the IMF, they go to countries um, in proportion to their quotas uh, in the IMF. And so they're broadly distributed and a large share um, end up going to advanced and developed uh, and middle income countries. But a substantial share will go, um, significant resources will go um, to the poorest countries that are most in need. And importantly, many advanced countries have indicated a desire and willingness to channel portions of their own allocations um, back to provide further support to these low-income countries. For example, the IMF has a poverty reduction and growth fund um, that many countries are likely to um, either lend or donate portions of their own SDR allocations. And that will really multiply uh, the impact of an SDR allocation on the poorest countries in the world. You mentioned accountability. We do want to make sure that the SDR allocation goes to uh, support relief um, and economic uh, support in the lowest income countries. And uh, we're working with other countries and the IMF to design a disclosure and reporting framework that um, would enable us to see how the SDRs that have been allocated have been used and to monitor the ways in which they have supported uh, the purposes that we have in mind. Wonderful. Uh, next question comes from uh, the chair, uh, president and uh, CEO of William Blair, but more importantly, the chair uh, uh, of the board of directors of the Chicago uh, Council on Global Affairs, John Edelson. Thank you, Ivo, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, for being here today. Uh, you, in your letter to the G20 about six weeks ago, you urged uh, the G20 to go big and take significant fiscal and monetary policy actions and avoid withdrawing support too early in order to foster economic growth. So a couple kind of related questions to that. Um, how big is big when you encourage them to go big? Is there a limit to how much debt either the US or the G20 can incur? And at what point does it become deflation, sorry, inflationary? And if we and they go big, how do we withdraw support without causing another recession? Well, those are great, those are great questions. Um, Congress um, recently passed a $1.9 trillion package, um, the American Rescue Plan to address the pandemic and its economic consequences. And I would describe that as going big. Um, the purpose of the package is to address the needs um, of American uh, households, families, uh, companies that have been adversely affected by the pandemic to avoid scarring, uh, to avoid damage that could permanently impact the ability of individuals and families to get to the other side of the pandemic and, re and um, get back on track with their lives and to avoid the failure of small businesses that are the lifeblood of their communities and that provide so many jobs to Americans. So um, we've designed the package to direct support um, to make sure that uh, people, and especially the minority and low wage workers who've been um, so adversely affected by this crisis to make sure that they have income uh, during the time that they um, are jobless, uh, to make sure that they have enough food to eat, uh, to make sure that they can keep a roof over their head um, and don't lose uh, a family home, 
Um, it provides money to state and local governments um, for a variety of programs to um, address the burdens of the pandemics, to get their local economies um, on track, and to begin to address infrastructure needs that were highlighted by the pandemic, such as the absence of uh, broadband that penalized so many rural families and families in low income areas um, when their children needed that in order to participate in school. Um, can we afford this? Well, I believe that we do have fiscal space to be able to afford it. Um, in, in part because we've been in a low interest rate environment in the United States, and that's been true among developed countries generally in recent decades. And for reasons that I believe are not just transitory, but reflect longer term structural problems. So in spite of the fact that US debt has risen quite a bit relative to the economy, um, if you go back as far as uh, 2007, um, when US debt to GDP ratio was 35%, it's now risen to around 100%. But the interest burden on the debt because of these interest rate trends has been um, completely unchanged. Um, will it be inflationary? Um, I strongly doubt that it's going to cause inflationary pressures. Um, we're in a deep hole um, where the US economy is still down around 9 million jobs. And if we were to count individuals who have dropped out of the labor force to take care of uh, children and because of health concerns, the true US unemployment rate is close to 9%. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that without the American Rescue Plan, the economy would probably take until 2024 to get back to full employment. But I'm hopeful that if the vaccination program proceeds um, as it has been and is successful, that we can get back to full employment um, next year. Um, we had before the pandemic an unemployment rate of three and a half percent. And uh, the problem for a very long time has been inflation that's too low, not inflation that's too high. Um, if, if the package did prove to be inflationary, we have the tools to address it. So I see the risks as asymmetric that I worry much more about um, long-term adverse consequences from not doing enough than it, problems that would result from doing uh, too much. So I do believe we have the fiscal space um, to act boldly. I think it's important in mitigating the suffering of the pandemic and the long-term adverse consequences to uh, US potential output um, if we fail to do so. It's important for us to learn the lessons from the 2008 um, financial and economic crisis. We had a very slow recovery um, after that crisis. It took us almost a decade to get the economy fully back on track. And um, it's important that we not repeat that experience. So um, I, th I think that we're doing the right thing. And longer term, um, we, we are, the President Biden and Vice President Harris have proposed now a recovery plan that's addressed at um, dealing with longer term challenges facing the US economy. Slow growth, this is a package that will over a decade invest in our crumbling infrastructure and our roads, bridges, highways, um, broadband structures, the electric grid, um, invest in people, giving them the tools and training they need to be productive in research and development. Over the long term, uh, these investments uh, are 
the cornerstone of making our economy competitive. Secretary Yellen, uh, I know you have a hard stop at quarter to the hour, so thank you so much for joining us today, uh, honoring us with your, uh, your, your virtual presence uh, for uh, your first big international speech. We appreciate uh, you uh, being part of our council family now. We hope to see you in person in Chicago not to, in the not too distant future. In the meantime, uh, I join uh, everyone here in, in thanking you for uh, your remarks and, uh, and for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ivo, and thank you for hosting me. Much appreciated.